he's kind yeah. to an extent. Uh, he loves he's his wife. A, he, loves his wife. He has a code. Yeah. Yeah. episode 19 of the audiobook club podcast my name's jonathan and i'll be hosting today's episode and i'm joined by the usual michael stephen and jason in this episode we're going to be covering treasure island written by robert louis stevenson and read by philip glenister daniel mays catherine tate and owen teal does anybody else want to introduce themselves say hello hello, hello. hi Happy so, New Year, everyone! We're we're definitely <laughs> recording this in in 2024. This <laughs> yes, <is> this is live, <laughs> live. but not happy Chinese New Year. No, yes, Western not, New Year. Not, yeah. not happy that. <laughs> Summary of the book: basically short and sweet here because um, it's a very easy premise to summarize. But it's basically a, an adventure novel which tells the story of a group of buccaneers on the search for a buried treasure. So you've got classic pirates and this is one of uh, a very classic book as well and as we'll probably get on to has inspired a lot of modern pop culture surrounding pirates why did i choose this book well number one pirates obviously everybody pirates are the the kind of thing that's uh it's funny uh, you obviously i think it's kind of like a pirate is used to be like you know murderers thieves rapists and whatever and now kids dress up as them for her and for Halloween and stuff and they're like seen as like almost like a because of maybe things like Pirates of the Caribbean and stuff they're seen as almost like a funny or, cartoony yeah cartoony yeah. I think I think it was things like this book though that kind of influenced people. yeah Cost, pirate costumes and stuff because yeah. it's more light hearted than I guess like when you loved in the time of Pirates it was probably more like a fret but whereas when this was written it was kind of just as after Pirate Age I know those piracy still happens but like the pirates that we kind of talk about here. Well, only if you, only if you lived in like you know, Somalia. island territory. <laughs> if you lived in like the middle of Europe or somewhere, you're probably fine. Yeah, or if you were protected by the British Navy, which absolutely dominated yeah. the, the seas in those times. Yeah. So, as well as pirates, this book is something a bit different than our usual. Um, usually, it's just a narrator just repeating the words as they were written in the book whereas this has been adapted by audible into uh, an audible audio drama so that kind of just means that they've basically it's like the as you probably know from the narrator list it's basically a bunch of actors and they kind of you know get on the character and pl- there's different rather than one person you know trying to do a bunch of different voices which usually some of the voices are good and some are bad um this is like you know the character or the person voicing the character is kind of suited to the character. Also, you've got like a lot of sound effects as well. So, particularly in this book, there's a lot of you know sword fights, guns, and stuff. So you get a lot of that. And it's I personally, I'll find out what you guys thought, but I think it's very immersive. And then finally, that this is just you know one of the classic adventure tales, a very famous book. Although, of course, Michael never heard of it. Like, well, <laughs> <That's> uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'll pass it over then to the others to let let me know what what they knew about this book before had they read it and just give a brief kind of you know summary of what you thought um just a high level before we get on the spoiler territory so we'll go to michael first um before we go to michael uh who won the guessing game oh <laughs> the guessing game <laughs> did we play the guessing game i yeah i and i won <laughs> well <laughs> I actually listened to that today. Michael said some extra stuff <laughs> at the end, but yeah, I think I think both of you covered it very well. Oh, did I not guess? Is that what it was? You had already read, read the book before. Yeah, that's that's yeah. I was yeah. gonna say yeah. yeah. So can we remember what you said? I actually listened to it today. I think Jason, you said like pirates and looking for treasure on an island. 
Jason basically said every tro- uh, every pirate trope and left me with nothing else to say. <laughs> well, because See, though, every I pirate think that's trope perfect comes answer from this though, book. because this is where a lot of pirate tropes came from. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that is exactly it, like, that's Jason spot on. Yeah, used his authority of getting in there first and just you know stealing the answer. So yeah. you know, Michael, you had to be more assertive. So yeah, we'll award the point to Jason. I, lo- <laughs> I literally had nothing left to say. Yeah. <laughs> Much like a pirate, you have to take what you want, Michael. That's what you don't understand. Uh, I, I had to I guess say, after uh, Stephen guessed the Shining plot, you know, it's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now we'll pass it over to Michael and you can give me your high-level thoughts about the book. Yeah, so go. I have to say at the top here that I have very mixed feelings about audio dramas. Uh, I've talked about the Truth podcast on here before, which is a short audio drama uh, podcast, and I love that podcast. However, um, I was going to recommend a, a little known science fiction book called Ender's Game. However, I, I listened I listened to the the only version I could get my hands on, and it was an abridged audio drama version of Ender's Game, and I really did not like it. And I was like, I can't bring this up on the podcast because I just do not think it's a good book at all. It's made, it's turned a good book into a bad book, in my opinion. So when I heard that this was an abridged audio drama, I was a bit, had a bit of trepidation there. But listening to it, I can say that I, I really liked, really liked this book. I thought it was a really fun book. It was a really straightforward book, as Stephen has already said, and I'm sure we will touch on ad nauseum on this review, that this basically invented all the pirate tropes that we, it didn't, it didn't just invent some of them, it seemed to invent all of them, like the the legs, the, the wooden leg, the parrot on the shoulder, X marks the spot, pirates singing yo-ho and a bottle of rum, black, all that stuff. Spot, yeah, yeah, it's it's all seems to have come from this book, which is pretty incredible that like you would have thought it was all pieced together over time, not just completely envisioned by one piece of piece of work. But I thought it was a really fun story. I thought the performances were all really, really good. They brought to brought it to life. The sound effects and everything, it's different for what we usually review because we usually do like minimalist books where it's just a narrator talking. I thought they worked really well and they added to the story rather than being distracting, which was sort of my fear. I thought that everything about this production was really, really good and I really enjoyed it. Very good. Stephen, pass it over to you. Sure, yeah. Um yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I also had some trepidations when I heard it was an audio drama. I think I spoke before about how I tried, uh, I think it was a Star Wars audio drama, and I really hated it because it was it was too distracting. Like There was a lot of ambient sounds and stuff that just, I, I don't know, maybe it was <laughs> the person narrating again, I'm not sure, but I really didn't like it. Uh, but this, this one, I think it was really well done. I'm not sure if it was because it was a wide cast of characters or because the performances were so good, but it was just really well done. The only slight problem that I had with the the uh, production was that sometimes it was like something would happen as if you were watching it, right? Like, you know, I don't want to get into spoilers, but when, you know, when his dad falls ill at the start, it's like it, it, the characters kind of react to that, but it's kind of like... So you're you're kind of reacting like delayed from the characters, and it's kind of there's like a disconnect there with my brain. And there was other times too, like a sword fight or something, and you know they they would like their sword would they would drop a sword or something, but you'd have to like a character would have to explain it or something before you noticed that it happened. But everybody else had already reacted to it. You know what I mean? I agree with that point too, Stephen, because like an absence of description, it had to use those sound effects. But at times you you kind of were like. Wait, what just happened? Yeah, it was more so at the start of the book. I think I kind of got used to it, or else it just went away. I'm not sure, but it wasn't a big deal once I once I you know got into it and everything. Now the book itself, I've I've read it before, although it was a long time ago. I think it was actually in secondary school, and I couldn't I can't I couldn't remember a lot of the plot. I remember a certain part like with Pew and um, some stuff about Ben gone in the house and everything certain plot points I could remember but most a lot of it I was going on sort of semi-blind and I, I really enjoyed it I think it was really well done um really well written and uh very immersive like you said Johnny yeah cool um and Jason um yeah I was actually quite excited to have um 
an audio drama. I think I've maybe mentioned before, I think maybe when you have spoke about Norse mythology before, um, I have previously listened to all three of the Sandman audible recordings. Ah, right. Yeah. Sandman. They're they're based on like a graphic novel, you know, but that like the cast in that is is ridiculously stacked for those three books, and I really enjoyed the production on on that, so I was quite excited to have another sort of similar experience, and it it lived up to what I sort of had hoped for, you know. Again, I th- I thought it was really well done, um, and just in terms of what Stephen has sort of said about uh, like the 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 sound effects sort of coming on and we're sort of catching up. To what's happened as people react, I didn't really struggle too much with that. I don't think, maybe I just wasn't listening hard enough and just went along with it. But I, I, I did. I really enjoyed this book. It wasn't too long, wasn't too short, and I think they sort of filled it in quickly. Cause I feel like the the actual book and reading would be a bit longer than the sort of six and a half hour runtime that this was slightly longer. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of agree with what, um, more or less, uh, Stephen and Michael said too about the. There's sometimes I think it happens near the start. There was like a like a scuffle or whatever, and like it's hard to know, you know, who wins the scuffle or what's uh, yeah. come yeah. for like yeah. about ten seconds after. So uh, that first time that that happened, I think I was a bit kind of like confused. But after that, I just kind of go right. I know that I'm not going to know what the outcome is, but I know they will tell me in about ten seconds. So I just kind of like. Yeah. Right, well, that you know, so I've, I can't open myself that's, up to it. That's the one that kind of sticks out to me uh, the most. Is I think it was the captain and black dog and Jim's in the background reacting yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah. And it's like he's like, oh, and uh, like, what who, just happened? What who actually <laughs> won the fight or whatever? And you do, you don't know what happens then until yeah. it's actually explained. Then ten seconds later, but yeah, there's like a lot of uh, people talking and like these really trusting voice, like "Come here, my laddie. Come here. Yeah. Come here." And then they. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, what just happened? To her? It's Black Dog and Pew both do that. They're like trying to be nice, and then yeah. just, <laughs> it was giving yeah. me. It's kind of like, like after, after you listen to it, you cannot like like ten seconds later, you know, then you understand that I like you understand then all that boy was trying to act like nice and nice, trying to be forceful, but like when the, when it's happening, you're yeah. kind of confused at what's happening. Um, but I kind of like that. So, so, other than that, I I really enjoyed this book. Um, I thought the audio drama was just so different than what we usually experience and i just thought yeah i can see yeah the the worries that you had that it might be distracting and stuff and i can see that it would be and i think this is going to be a case by case basis like i wouldn't expect all audio dramas to be as well done as this but i think this one was really well done and like yeah it just added to the immersion of this book yeah i I think for sure it depends on the production and who who the cast of characters is if it's one person doing the full cast or if it's like you know different voice yeah. actors or, or actresses yeah i think that definitely makes a big difference i think this book in particular too because it's so character focused and stuff and the characters are really really good in this book and um, we'll talk more about them in a bit i think it really suited this kind of like you know different people to really give it the justice it deserves in terms of the character depth and stuff uh, another thing that works in its favor too is the fact that it's such a simple and straightforward story so that kind of, because there's not that a lot of complexity to the plot, it kind of allows the production to be a bit more complex. Because yeah, if like, you were like deal, dealing with like a complex plot and complex production, you might have been feeling overwhelmed. But yeah, like if you did this with Game of Thrones, I just don't think it would work at all. Like Game yeah, of Thrones is exactly. too massive. There's too many characters. It's yeah, it's, it just wouldn't work. But yeah, uh, overall, I really enjoyed this book. So we'll move on now to more in-depth review we'll kind of the book itself the one the version we listened to um had 12 chapters so we're kind of i'm not going to say chat this is chapter by chapter but more or less is i'm going to just kind of give more or less small summaries of what's happened and we'll go into more depth about it so the book kind of kicks off with the protagonist jim hawkins him and his mum and dad run an inn in bristol in england and this character shows up called the captain um, or identifies himself as the captain um we later find out his name is billy bones but yeah at this point he's known as the captain and he's just kind of this mysterious character he's he's quite forceful um he's he seems like he's 
kind of like got a, a few stories to tell and, and he's, he causes a wee bit of trouble and you know the, the locals kind of don't really like him and stuff like that but Jim I think J- the whole point of this book is it's kind of like a coming of age for Jim and you know he's he's, he's kind of looking to get out of this boring life that he's in and go on an adventure so I think he's kind of drawn to this mysterious character and he kind of knows that this guy's seen some stuff so basically the captain more or less tells Jim to look out for any one with a like a one with one leg so for, i really like that the fact that's you know that uh you're already like on the lookout for this this, this a pirate essentially so anyway uh a bit later then a character called black dog shows up and basically gets into a fight with uh the captain and the captain wins the fight and black dog flees but then the captain who we find out then from black dog is called billy bones suffers a stroke so what did you think about this opening scene um what do you think about the introduction to the captain and jim who are kind of the two main characters so far that will go on into the story I liked it. it. It set up like a very ominous tone with the whole, you know, look out for the one-legged man thing and the, the sort of ambient music that was going on. And it, it really got me immersed from, from the get-go. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not really sure what else to say. It was good. Yeah, I found it a really effective opening. Um, I was hooked right on, to be honest. Um, the character Jim, it's the classic kind of hero's journey character. This this boy who is yearning for adventure. He's kind of unsatisfied with his his little boxed in life. He he wants to see beyond the, the, the walls of his end and beyond Bristol. And then we get the the character who who you know, but we learn it later as Billy Bones, but his first entry just as the captain. Uh I it's again one of the cliches of the genre which is the the drunken pirate which is is a cliche now but it wasn't cliche when this book this book created the trope that then became the cliche so yeah it's it's another classic you know piece of pirate storytelling here that the, the drunken pirate with and i love the sense of mystery behind this guy's past and everything and as Stephen was said you have like the sense of urgency that's kind of created it's like on the lookout for for the guy with the wooden leg uh, and it's what's going on here i kind of want to know more here i want to know more about who this guy is why is he on the run from this guy there, i'm sure a lot of things are tied together here that will become clear so it was a very effective opening for me i thought it was actually probably my favorite part of the whole whole book um, that's interesting i i like the open i like i like the setup from the open like i really enjoyed the sort of as he's both mentioned like the the ominous warning about the man with the wooden leg and like i enjoyed the sort of payoff from that a few chapters later but i i I actually i struggled with the captain i actually really just didn't like the captain as a person i know he's he's just an alcoholic we're probably not supposed to like him very much but i find that sort of taken away from my enjoyment of these first couple of chapters and just how 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 jim was a bit of a pushover for him to be honest more than anything, like I know, Jim was just keen to get out, out from the end and get out to sea, and this captain was his sort of way to sort of live vicariously. But I, I just didn't like the captain. It sort of didn't take away from the the opening for me. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're supposed to like the captain, like, but I, I get what you're saying. But I, I think it added to it that everybody was sort of scared to him because it, it builds him up a bit more as this sort of tough. You know, as he claims a sailor, right? But we know he's a pirate. And then, you know, he he's kind of hiding out there, waiting for people who are even more scared. You know, scarier than him. That they're supposedly coming along looking for him. So, yeah. I thought of yeah. that. The, the um, to make suspense. a a weird a weird draw a weird par parallel. It's kind of like when Raditz comes in on Dragon Ball Z, and then you Amazing. hear the the other guys are coming later who are even worse. <laughs> it builds up the the. The threat even more but and i i like that um jim was about i agree that he was a pushover but i i I thought that was a good thing for the story because it is i think it's an intentional character flaw and it makes it more satisfying later in the story when he sort of he takes charge more and he becomes more inventive with the way he solves conflicts i think uh this is not just an adventure story but also a coming of age story for jim and that's kind of reflected we'll talk more when we get to the end 
that he does have a complete arc and a complete change from yeah. who he is from the start of the story compared to the end of the story. And something you've mentioned before about other characters, like it is the sort of hero's journey as well. Yeah. Like, you know, he's he's not got a great life. He's keen for more. He becomes, well, like he progresses on from his pushover beginnings, you know, to, uh, to arguably, arguably become the hero. I think he's got a boring life, but I think they're they're cozy enough because like they run on him and stuff, and it seems to do all right. <laughs> like I guess this, I guess the yeah, exactly what you were away. saying there. I thought you were about to draw this comparison, Michael. Was that it was kind of like the Shire, and it's like it was boring, but they all like it to be boring, and then Gandalf comes on and just you know disrupts things, and that's why they hate him. <laughs> that's that's what I kind of envision. Captain Gandalf Raddatz, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody laugh for me, would you? It's not the Harry Potter opening of the hero's journey where he has an absolutely miserable life. Definitely not. But it's it's kind of like the Luke Skywalker opening where he, he's got a pretty good life. It's, you know, he gets on well with his work and everything, but he just looks at the sunrise and, you know, I wish I wish there was something more. It's kind of that yearning that you get from him. Yeah. Look look at look at how many things we just were able to compare to. Like this, this book has just inspired many stories. Like Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, for myself, I really enjoyed the opening. I think the book is strong throughout. I think maybe this next bit that I'm going to summarize um, in a minute is probably the weakest part of the book. But I think this it started off very strong, again, bringing in the element of mystery and then the sense of urgency with this looking out for this one-legged character. And I, I like the captain, I think, just because he is the kind of spanner in the works. It's, you know, he's he's just all of a sudden he's just shown up and, you know, he's, he's taken over. And it's, I don't, I don't really understand. Or I'd probably not really explain well, but like why he calls himself the captain or whatever. But even though it's like he's the small fish, like there's these worst guys. They come, and maybe he has like a, you know, he's coming on knowing that he's going to be a big dog here and trying to big himself up by calling him, referring to himself as the captain and stuff. Um, when actually he's just a coward at the end of the day. So possibly that is something around those lines. But yeah, I think this is you know when you kind of get gems. Yeah, as you said there, Michael, the comparison the Luke Skywalker just kind of jumps, just been looking for something like this to come along. So you're, you're like he's just grabbing this opportunity, no matter what what's kind of happened. Um, even though it seems already quite dangerous, and most people would probably be like, you know what, I want, I want nothing to do with this guy. You know, jumps just drawn straight on, like. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay. So Bones is basically out of action, lying in bed after suffering from a stroke. And Jim's father, who was also sick for a while, um, dies as well. Um, so it's basically just the, uh, Jim and his mum looking after them now. And then a few days later, Pew, a blind beggar, shows up at the inn. And, you know, it's one of, like we said there, he kind of comes in acting all nice and like he's blind. He is actually blind, but he like, you know, plays on it a bit. And then he just turn, like, turns really nasty to Jim all of a sudden. Um, essentially looking for the captain so this is the second person now that's showed up looking for the captain so obviously it's at this stage where we're suspecting that uh, as the reader anyway you're suspecting okay why are they looking for the captain the captain's obviously got someone that they want pew then uh our jim basically takes pew to the captain or they basically wait for the captain they, sh- they come home and then um pew give gives the captain the black spot which is another famous pirate trope which is basically like a warning or a summons and this causes the captain to have another stroke and which actually kills him. So then Pew and his his accomplices uh, attack the inn um, looking for whatever they're looking for and Jim and his mum kind of escape. I think they just like, jump out a window and then the like officers kind of show up and you know scare away the Pew and the bad guys and actually trample Pew to death. So when Jim and his mom escape, they have the ch- the captain's sea chest, and they actually find a map within it, which is of an island. And again, you get uh, an X mark and a spot on this island. So this is the island where uh, the infamous pirate Captain Flint has hidden, hidden his treasure. So then Jim shows the map to um, the doctor, who was uh, who did appear at some point to treat um, Jim's father. And to another character, Squire John Trelawney, and they decide essentially to go on a expedition to the island. What do you think about this this section? Um, basically, leading up now, um, you find out about the map and find out about 
or, or basically the ex- expedition has been decided that it's going to take place and Jim is going to uh, serve as a cabin boy on the expedition. For me, I feel like these chapters were the weakest part of the book. I, I just, mm. I didn't have much peril from like, you know, Jim and his mom being chased by the other, by the other pirates. Um, I, I didn't, I, I enjoyed the character of Pew. You know, I did, I did like Pew um, as a character. I find him a bit intimidating, even though he was blind. But I, I think this is arguably the weakest part of the book and the part of the book that I probably struggled the most with in terms of keeping myself engaged. But at least it sort of led us to the part of, like, they're creating a plan, they're going to go on an adventure. You know, it sort of it kicks in the gear quite quickly, at least, I find. so. Uh, but for me, this was a bit of a slow start for me. I had sort of mixed feelings about this part of the book. So the the start where, well, not start, but the, the start of this section where Jim and his mother are kind of like, you know, hiding from the, the, the pirates who've come to their end and everything. And, and you know, they, they try and make a getaway and stuff. I uh, I thought it was really suspenseful, actually. But then it did really did slow down once, you know, the the danger was gone and the, <clears throat> the squire and the doctor guy sort of came on the scene. And then I thought it was quite, like slow when you know they're at the squire's house and having dinner and all that crap <laughs> i was like just get to the pirate parts <laughs> <laughs> and i also don't like those two as characters but i suppose we'll talk about that later but yeah so, sort of mixed feelings for me um up and down yeah i sort of uh yeah i would agree with uh steven there about i think that part is probably the i don't even know if it was necessarily slow for me that was the issue for me anyway it was more that I just didn't find it that engaging. I, it was the pacing was fine, like the the scene of that length. I think maybe if those two characters were more interesting, I would have liked that scene more. But the stuff before that, I really enjoyed. I really really liked Pew as a character. The the brief you know moments that we get him anyway, I did find him intimidating as well. I thought the performance for Pew was really good. I thought this was like a good subtle kind of escalation of things it was more and more of this outside world was coming onto Jim's world and then um I find it quite funny in a kind of black comedy sort of way where uh you know his his dad was dying at the same time that uh Billy Bones was rambling and demanding all of Jim's attention it was kind of morbidly funny and then it was it was it was touching then um Jim's exchange with his dad at the end so I really, I really enjoyed the beginning of this section, and I think I had similar issues as Stephen. I was less tuned into the that specific part. Yeah, I, I don't even talk about Pew, but yeah, I, I like Pew as a character. You know, he's he's definitely gives off a scary vibe, for sure. Again, similar to what I said before, he's kind of he's he's a blind guy, but you can tell Billy Bones and everybody else is super afraid of him. And then that's magnified even further when the other pirates turn up because they're all like taking orders from him, even though he's like you know a blind like a blind pirate, which doesn't sound scary at all. But he's clearly yeah. got something terrifying about him, like a terrifying presence or something. So and the and the black spot, like the incident with that, the fact that Billy has a stroke because basically he's been marked. It kind of it also I think is effective at building up the scary figure of who has the sort of the antagonist of this story. Yeah, I'd agree that this, uh, like I said, this is probably the weakest part of the book for me, though I still quite enjoyed it. Again, Pew thought it was a brilliant character, gone too soon, though we did stay in a fantastic way, getting absolutely like mauled or trampled by horses. Um, and I think he's like, you know, shouting at them while they're riding up on him. Obviously he can't see, but he just stands there. And like, so good man, like, I th- I think that scene where he gets mowed down that that's the w- one of the scenes that I I really remember from reading it the first time in, in school for some yeah. reason I don't know why but stuck yeah, so a man getting trampled by horses is, is not something you see every day like <laughs> no he definitely doesn't see it anyway. <laughs> no <laughs> yeah I think again the, this is the part we find out of the treasure I guess you know us being in the century know all about uh, what the reveal was going to be and that it was buried treasure or a treasure map uh, i guess back when this was written it was again more fantastical i um, being like oh what is it uh, treasure maps fucking treasure whereas now we're kind of like a like treasure sure freaking put it on google maps like be there in five minutes here's a question we, we tangent 
Why do they bury the treasure? Obviously, because they can't like spend it all straight away. But why do they bury it? Like, why don't like? I you know? guess they hide hide it. So other people, because like where there's like pirates can't really put their treasure in a bank because obviously well, they're, they're not abiding I by the law. Suppose, yeah. Um, government's going to tax it or whatever. I don't, I don't know how but it works. You know, they obviously have to keep going back. <laughs> you get a get a wee deposit <laughs> so often. <laughs> and also, how are they going to cause or, you know, give the reason for such great stories to be written if there's no buried treasure? Someone had to bury the treasure. I suppose like, that's, that's true, yeah. <laughs> sure, didn't uh, Pablo Escobar, he, like, buried all his money. It's, you know, because he was obviously a massive drug dealer and had a lot of money that he couldn't declare or whatever or else, you know. I know that the government was pure corrupt anyway over there, but like you know, he buried it as well, even in modern day. So I guess it's it kind of as a thing when you've got a lot, a lot of money and you can't store it anywhere else. Even Escobar's influenced by Treasure Island. Yeah, I suppose. Now, now that I think about it, they, they so they buried the the cat. What's this? I can't remember the the actual cat's name, but they, so they buried it. But everybody got a bit like a share because they were talking about how they they'd spent it, like you know, yeah, X amount. And one of the characters Captain that we meet. In the next, yeah, the Captain Flint, yeah, one of the characters we meet in the next chapter bought a pub, <laughs> and you know he's doing business and everything. So it's like too, I they always that makes a bit more sense. They always create a map to the treasure, as in like the person that's going to be finding the treasure isn't the person that buried it, because obviously if you're the person buried it, you're going to remember where you've buried a large sum of money. Like you're not going to forget that. <laughs> but they always draw a map, as in like oh, I'll draw this map so future people can you know fight over this treasure and stuff like it's it's like they almost expect <laughs> to not be getting it themselves <laughs> but yeah no i think this it's just you know the this, this there's a scene too where they, you know they're building the crew and stuff as well where you get introduced to long john silver um a man with one leg so i don't know you know if this is a dangerous man or not i don't know if we've heard anything about a man with one leg but sense doesn't uh, strike me as good again the pirate trope of uh, one-legged pirates. So again, you can already, even though the he, he kind of like when you first introduce him, he's, he's a cook, and he um is brought onto the ship to be like a cook. But it actually turns out that he was part of the crew as well. You know, he starts off good, but you already know that this must be the one. Why would they have a one-legged man in here if it wasn't the one that's been foreshadowed? But I think that uh, yeah, no, this these few these chapters were kind of. Although not exciting, they were, you know, necessary chapters. They kind of bridge the gap to now what I think where the book starts picking up again. And you get a lot of the main plot points of the book. So basically what happens after the crew is formed is they um, set sail on Trelawney's boat, um, the Hispaniola. Jim, during the, the actual journey to the island, uh, Jim forms a strong bond with the, the, the cook Long John Silver. And one of the, the crew's first mate, uh, Mr. Arrow, seems to be washed overboard during a storm because he, I think he was like known to be a drunk. However, I, I think this, this obviously probably was some foul play of, you know, people knowing that he was a drunk and then the the bad people that are on the boat um, having thrown him off because he, he could have, like, whenever he's not drunk, he's probably maybe a sharp guy or whatever. So then uh, also on the journey, uh, Jim is hiding in an apple barrel um and he over uh, i don't know why why he's, he's on this apple barrel but um he overhears i wondered conf- why he climbed down too like, <laughs> yeah like just, why just why was he just like i'll just get on here for the crack like but um <laughs> uh, obviously he must hear people coming like, i couldn't remember exactly i mean maybe he hears people coming or he, he starts to hear the conversation so he's like almost like it's just, it already, i think he like, fell in he, like, 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 it was like the barrel was empty and i think he was like you know Looking down to see if there's uh, anything. <laughs> I'm mad, man. So anyway, he, over, he overhears the conversation between Long John Silver and another few of the crewmates. So basically, they actually turn out that um, they're pirates that were part of the original crew who um, buried this treasure. And so they they know that um, obviously this expedition's going. They find this treasure, so they know that the map's on board as well. So they've been hiding, and the during this conversation, they kind of reveal the plans that they're going to, whenever they get to the island, they're going to mutiny and kill everyone that's not a pirate, and then go and get the treasure themselves. So what do you think about the kind of all the section on the boat, and this kind of almost like a build-up to the action part, the kind of calm before the storm, so to speak? The first half of this section was the slowest for me, I think. 
obviously we're coming off the tail end of the, the whole square bit that I mentioned before and that I was kind of looking for a pick me up there then when we get to the pub I can't remember what it's called but Long John Silver's pub that he owns and all the pirates are in there like black dogs there and like you know it's like oh it's a bit weird that the, a man with one leg has a known associate of another man with one leg that we're supposed <laughs> to be looking out for it's a bit it's a bit sus but anyway yeah, that there's a there's a bit of uh, enjoyment there, but then once the crew was formed and they, they, they set sail and everything, I thought it slowed down again a bit until they got to the island. You know, it was a it was a bit tedious. I thought getting through this section, so also because I knew what was to come. You know, I was sort of anticipating um, more action bits. So I think this for me was was the slowest section, yeah, or the least enjoyable section. Uh, I think as soon as Long John Silver was introduced, I I think things sort of picked up for me. You know, as soon as we met this man with the wooden leg, it sort of, like, you know, you just knew that there was uh, some trouble with it. I, I think not intended. I was not intended, <laughs> but we'll, we'll pretend. Uh, everybody laugh and we'll edit it in. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I do, I, I quite, this is where things started to pick up for me, just as soon as Long John was sort of, introduced i uh, immediately find things just getting a bit more interesting like you know you can sort of see him sort of in the same pub of uh black dog and you know also then when jim overhears uh that they're planning the mutiny i think it's it's incre- it, 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 there's more suspense for me at this stage than there was any of the previous scenes in the book yeah, I have i have mixed feelings about this section uh i i kind of can see where both Jason and Stephen are coming from just to take my favorite position right on the middle of that fence. But oh, uh, the fence. I thought there were parts of it that I was less engaged with and that find a bit tedious seems a wee bit harsh, but I was I just wasn't as engaged with it as I was at the with the beginning of the book, except for the parts with Long, uh, Long John Silver. Um, obviously, I, I knew immediately from pop culture that who he was. It was telegraphed to us anyway that he was going to be a threat, but because of everything, because of how famous and how influential this book is, I immediately knew that this is this is the guy. This is like the main presence within this book. He's introduced as a cook. He's under under a guise uh, that we learn later when uh, fuck I forgot the name of the fucking main character of all things when Jim is hiding. Yeah. <laughs> Jim Jim is hiding out. You know, we, we learn of his nefarious plan and he seems very, he we before this, he, he's very charismatic and he's like, almost feels like he's being built up as the, the father figure, this role model that Jim now is absent of since his own father has passed away. And since he now, it, it's, and it's somebody who represents this adventure and this worldliness that Jim aspires to. So it kind of takes a turn then when we, uh, when he's hiding out and we hear that he's actually a, a pirate, he's an evil man, or he's at least in this moment he's represented as a as an evil man. Uh, so I, I thought I thought there was good and bad in this part. There was parts where I was I was less engaged with it, but anything I, I thought the performance of Long John Silver too brought a lot of gravitas to the character, and I was always engaged with what whatever scene he was on. It was uh, Owen Teal. Sir Alistair from Sir the Alistair. Game of Thrones. I nice. thought Long John yeah, was an absolutely fantastic character throughout um, and definitely here at the start as well. I just kept picturing Barbosa um, from Pirates of the Caribbean. He was a similar character, you know, very, <laughs> like you said, very charismatic, but kind of devious as well. Kind of trying to influence, you know, people all the time. And when, like, you know, whenever he's, things are getting out of control for him, like he's, he's, he's always, you know, pulling out all the tricks in the book to try and get in control again. Um, so I thought, you know, he's definitely my favourite character in the book. Yeah, I think, I think are, are we all agreed that Long John's, like, the best character in the, in the book? Or that he's good, he's a good character, maybe? Maybe not morally good, but, yeah, entertainment-wise, yeah. Entertainment-wise, entertainment yeah. Entertainment yeah. Definitely. And I think, I think for definitely. sure what you were saying, Michael, about the father figure thing, I think that definitely is at, at play here. I think there's a few characters that are like potential father figures for Jim, including Long John, the squire, the doctor. And he's sort of like, you know, 
at the end, not to spoil it or anything. He, he sort of has to make a choice about what kind of man he wants to be, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah, they're all, all of these men are representations of roads and, and pathways yeah. that Jim could, could potentially go down. Yeah, and the thing about Long John is that, yes, he's a pirate, and yes, they're seen as these, you know, evil, devious bad guys, but Long John has honour, he's intelligent, you know, he's kind yeah. to an extent, uh, he loves he's his got wife, a, he, loves his wife. He has a code. Yeah. Yeah. He's good with money, too, obviously, because, you know, he runs a successful business, <laughs> and he hasn't spunk all his money <laughs> from, you know, pirate. <laughs> yeah. And he's got a well-trained part, which I'm assuming he trained himself. <laughs> Yeah, they they like bring another random uh f- random piece of media. Uh, it reminded me kind of of like the Godfather because I remember uh reading about that before I watched it. Like, why does everybody consider this so good? And it was about how um the mafia have all these complex codes in it and everything, and it it kind of uh humanizes them more while while not taking away from like any of the evil acts that they may have committed it's the same same kind of things happen here i think with the pirates uh they have a code especially long john silver he's a very seems like a very intelligent well-read man as well and he he always sticks by that code so he does he does as you said Stephen, you used the word honor he does have his own kind of honor yeah the pi- all, all the pirates well most of them anyway are kind of honorable which is kind of weird like even at the start where they you know they give the black spot to to the captain I mean, that in itself is kind of weird because, you know, they're, 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 they're basically giving him a death sentence, but they, they like, deliver it all formally. And, uh, and they, they, it's like, uh, they warn him beforehand that it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if he were pure, pure evil, you would just, you know, sneak up behind him, shoot him, <laughs> or push him yeah. off the cliff or something. Yeah, you have a sense that they wouldn't do that because they're like, that's not the way things are done. Yeah. Like, they have to adhere to the way that they see that things are done. It's like you don't kill a man in cold blood, you kind of have to look him in the face and have a, an even fight, both on the same. So it's kind of like those, it's kind of like the, I can't remember what you call it, but it's like the honour honor among thieves or whatever, you know, it's like a... That's it, yeah. yeah. It's a bit like uh, John Wick in a way too. Like they tell him essentially that he's going to be hunted down and they, they give him a bit of, cha- bit of a chance to sort of get ready for this oncoming yeah. Yeah. fight for his life. That's you know? a good... Yeah. That's a good comparison, yeah, definitely. And I think there's there's a, there's another like it's it's kind of juxtaposed with like you know the the sort of law of people in the in the book because like if we talk, take an example that we already talked about this pew, the, he just gets run down by the law, right, with no warning or nothing. Yeah. They just and completely disregard him and just yeah, run just because he's, he's it, whereas they think he's trash, like yeah. So there's an intre- there's an interesting contrast there. It's funny too that they like, yeah, they're scared of like, I think they like near the end where they're they're basically talking about like the, that the pirates will get sent to the gallows and they're kind of like, you know, they're afraid of the gallows almost. So it's like they're afraid of the law's punishment. They'd rather face each other than face the law. Yeah, uh, I, th- I think I think I would rather get like cut down with a sword and hang. Hung. Yeah, <laughs> I think their whole thing is that they're like free. You know, they're at sea and they're free. They'd rather be that. And get killed in a fight and be stuck in a jail. Yeah, yeah, which I think is probably like part of the big wish fulfillment of like uh, this is a big story for kids, obviously as well. Um, the the fact that they can probably relate to that feeling of wanting to be free on the open seas. It's that's what a what's so appealing about pirate stories, isn't it? It's yeah, you're completely free. You're not even even people that are obviously good are still confined by the laws of society, whereas pirates are just they just do what they want, like. And I think, like, he, he could have easily, like, went too far and romanticized the pirates, done something like people who make, like, gangster movies are often say, oh, you're actually just, you're making this life look great. You're yeah. romanticizing these horrible people. I don't think um, Robert Lee Stevenson does that with the pirates. I don't think he romanticizes them too much. He, he sort of cartoonizes them, for, but as a kid's book as well. But he's still, I think they're still very much painted as as villains who Jim doesn't ultimately doesn't want to be like. Yeah. Well, I guess now that gets us on to the next, the next section. So they basically arrive at the island and the mutant mutiny begins. So there's a lot of fighting and stuff going on. Um, uh, a few of uh, some of the crew goes ashore including Jim and Long John and basically a lot of the pirates. 
and Long John uh, Silver kills a man in front of Jim and he flees um, into the woods after seeing that. So obviously at that point he's made a decision to, um, I don't want to be on his side, essentially. But he, Jim bumps into a marooned pirate named Ben Gunn. Um, so he was actually also a former member of the original pirate crew that buried the treasure. So he has been marooned on the island for like three years. And I, I can relate with him a lot. Like he's, he just has this love of cheese. It's the most of the thing I can remember about him. He just Absolutely wants some cheese. Absolutely loves cheese. And then there's a, the funny about them where is it the doctor or is it uh, Trelawney says that he's got like a snuff box. And he's like, but you've never seen me take snuff. It's because I've got a wee block of Parmesan on there. <laughs> I'm like, I was yeah. like, why, why do you just have a block of Parmesan? <laughs> just to have it? I, but like, I, I know he obviously, it's, it's kind of like, you know, Sam in Lord of the Rings where he's got like a salt, you know, he keeps with him just to flavor the food all the time. Um, it's probably similar to that. Like, it's just, just this wee thing. Where do you keep your Parmesan, Jonathan? <laughs> true, true. I don't have a snuff box. Just so. a wee baggy. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, yeah, the mutineers arm themselves, take the ship, and then, like, Jim and the rest of, essentially, the good members of the crew take refuge in an abandoned stockade on the island. And then we have like a truce um, between the pirates and um, I'm just going to call them the good guys, um, the <laughs> Jim's group. <laughs> so there's like a, a truce between them and uh, Long John Silver comes out and more or less kind of saying, you know, you surrender, just, you know, let us get this treasure um, and we'll not kill anyone or hurt anyone. And then the I think it's the doctor he talks with, or is it Trelawney again? And they're kind of like, no, you surrender. Like we we've kind of we've got the we're on the fort and all we're protected and stuff, and we've got the map. Um, so the both sides are kind of they're kind of at an impasse. And then the, uh, later that night, I think the um, pirates attack the stockade, um, where there's casualties on both sides. So what did you think then about this, this kind of first part on the island? The first um, kind of getting on. And this is where I'll, I'd say a lot of the fighting happens. Um, a lot of the action scenes are in this this section. Yeah, I I enjoyed this part. Uh, this is, as you said, Jonathan, this is where the action ramps up and and, and we get some conflict. I really, I really liked the setting of the island. I really was intrigued by the character of Ben Gunn. I thought it was, you know, as you said, his love of cheese. It was a pretty funny, quirky part of the book as well. And kind of the, the conflict that happens with them is is we're starting to get into the meat of the story. It was quite exciting. And the sound effects and everything of the production brought that to life more. I thought it was a very effective way to do it and kind of bring you there and to the chaos that was happening. So, yeah, I thought that, I thought this was a pretty fun part of the book. Yeah, I would have doubt uh I would agree with what Michael's saying there. I think the, the island and the setting of the island is, well, it's obviously where the majority of the book takes place, but it's it's uh, definitely the best the des- the best best setting of the book for me. I think the pace are quickened up a wee bit here as well. You know, I did find things maybe dragged and were a bit slower initially. Maybe it's because I didn't engage with those scenes maybe just as much or as well. But um, I think when things got to the island, so say the stakes were raised, uh, a lot more action, set pieces happening, you know, some characters getting killed off, uh, meeting some more interesting characters, as you say, like Ben, and getting to sort of see, well, getting to see one side of, of Long John Silver anyways, the more sort of sinister side, or the greedy side, I suppose, because I think it is only purely fueled by money and this treasure. But yeah, it was uh, it was good. Things picked up here. His wife's going to tell him off, Jason, if, if he doesn't bring them back the treasure that's <laughs> he just loves his wife like fair play he loves that woman wife guy loves it yeah it's supposed, it's supposed for me I, I, I like this this part of the book it definitely had that mix of like you know funny moments but also like really big action set pieces which is, you know I've taken all the boxes and then again I was enjoying the sort of like contrast between the pirates and the for lack of a better word the good guys like you were saying so you know both sides are kind of agree to this truce but it's like it's kind of weird because it's you know pirate books so you think oh they're gonna lie like they're just gonna turn on them as soon as they can but it doesn't happen so i find that all really interesting 
I think this this was the favorite the favorite section of the book for me. Um, this sort of second, well, maybe two thirds in sort of period. Uh, ben Gunn was a bit of a weirdo. Uh, he loves his cheese, but like, <laughs> I was I was I, I'm not sure if they talked about it, but I was wondering why he was marooned. Like, why did they leave him behind? Just because he wouldn't fuck up about cheese. <laughs> <laughs> what was he just it? loves I mean, cheese, sure. love. Do you remember now? Because I'm not too sure. Mm, nah. Not too sure. Nah, I mean, yeah. it probably isn't really discussed in a way. I mean, I think there's a good thing about the Ben Gunn is like, you know, obviously he uh, we're in the spoiler territory anyway. He actually has all the treasure. Um, he's already pre got because he obviously knew where it was buried. But he's happy enough to basically just give it to people as long as he gets it left home because he just wants some cheese or whatever. You know, it's it's like he doesn't even care about the treasure anymore. He's he kind of, you know, it's kind of a good, a nice thing that you're like, you know, the money doesn't even matter if you're freaking marooned on an island. What's the point in having yeah. all this gold? Like, so he obviously just shows you that's kind of st- stupid. They kind of be fighting over this money and stuff. Um, it's just the little things like a wee bit of parmesan that makes all the difference. Like, yeah, and a wee snuff box. And you, <laughs> just one wee snuff box. I, I definitely felt felt sorry for Ben. Yeah, being left there for for a couple of years and. He cl- clearly lost his sanity a good deal. Like. <laughs> I, I was hoping he would. It was you know because when you're marooned, the, the whole thing about leaning left of the pistol, um, with the one bullet on it. I was hoping that would be then a him going after like long. I guess it was probably the Captain Flunt, the original pirate captain that marooned him. Like, but I was just hoping he was. He just had some vendetta against Long John Silver and was going after him. With this bullet was saved for him. Yeah. Um. Again. It's like another pi- bit of the pirate code because they leave them with a thing rather than starve to death. They leave them with one shot just to kill themselves. It's another kind of mercy or like pirate code thing. Um, another honourable. Yeah. yeah. Although I know it's them leaving them to die and stuff like that, which is obviously... <laughs> but, you know, it's like this wee small bit of niceness, kindness in this bad thing they're doing to you. It's yeah. like a, a kind of a, an acknowledgement of, yeah, we want you to die, but you're, you're one of us, kind of. Yeah. Right, the, way I think, like... the way I think I can, <laughs> you kill yourself, I'd, I'd probably just rather them shoot you. Like, it would be far harder to kill yourself than them. They just, they, uh, I'd rather they just yeah. fucking, like, uh, shot you and threw you off the book or something. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess this part two um, has a lot of the, the audio drama aspect um, because you, here's where you get a lot of the gunfire, cannon fire, um, clashing of swords and stuff. Um, so I thought that part was quite strong here too, um, and really just like I think this is you know where the audio drama, but really, really kind of came came into its own and like was you know made the difference. And like if this wasn't the audio drama part, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have felt as actiony, if you know what I mean. So like I wouldn't have felt as fast it wouldn't have felt as fast paced to me. I think just having those sound effects and stuff just made it feel like a, like an action scene. Um, so I thought that, yeah, I really enjoyed that part. Um, although I think the next part of the book is actually my favorite part. I thought this part was, was quite strong as well. And yeah, the, the kind of the truce and stuff, you know, in this conversation with the Long John and the Doctor and Jim and stuff beforehand, it's kind of like, you know, again, more kind of calm before the storm and, you know, people talking and, you know, you get the, the attack then and people actually getting killed and stuff. I think then, so after, after the same Jim, heads out and makes his way to the, the uh, Hispaniola. Um, so at this stage, I think there's kind of only a couple of people actually were left on it. They no look after it, but I think it's actually kind of like been drifting. Um, so they've kind of lost it. But he, he basically finds it and cuts, cuts the anchor and basically like lets it, you know, drift along further to kind of take it so that, you know, he kind of gets it in the position where they're in control, the good side's in control of it, as opposed to the pirates. And there's, there, when he boards the ship, there's a pirate on there who, who's actually been injured in a drunken dispute with one of his companions. So I'm assuming there's a few pirates on it and they've all fallen out. Um, as probably does, that's the only thing with being a pirate, you know, even though you've got all your pirate mates at any stage, you know, you could all stab each other in the back. But yes, this is, I like, I really, this is probably my favorite part of the book because there's a lot of tension here because I think the book kind of lets you and the hands' uh, intention that he's going to essentially kill, kill Jim. Um, I think he it just, he needs Jim at this stage to, to try and move the boat, but he's, he's going to um, kill him obviously because he knows he's, he's not on their side. But I think then at some stage Jim uh realizes that um or he kind of sees that Tans has a knife concealed 
So he's kind of aware of it, and he knows that this this attack is coming. But I think there's just a lot of tension in this this scene. And then Jim, um, uh, when Hans does actually try to kill Jim, Jim shoots him and kills him. So yeah, just because I enjoyed this part so much, I just wanted to see what you thought about this part and just two characters on on the the Hispaniola. Like, yeah, I I agree. Basically, everything you said about this part, Jonathan, I thought this was. A really really great part and it was a really it was great writing for um the slow kind of build of tension and this dynamic between two characters like almost uh a game of chess or or who who blinks first kind of thing and it, it, you're really tense for jim you're you're really on his side and just hoping that he can find a way out of it that i was this was the most engaged i was with the book apart from the very start so this was probably, I said the start was my favorite. This is probably my second favorite part of the book after the beginning. I was completely on board with everything that was happening here. And I found it a very satisfying outcome where Jim kind of sort of symbolically becomes, turns from a boy into a man here because it's uh, he stands up for himself. And as Jason pointed out at the start of the book, he's kind of making kind of a pushover where he kind of, he finally gets the better out of one of these, out of one of these men and, and wins the conflict. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just going to echo what you lads are saying, really. Um, I think this is my favourite part of the book. Again, I just, I really love the tension of it all. Like, you know, Jim knowing that Hans has the knife and you're just sort of wondering when he's going to strike and how it's going to happen and how is Jim going to defend himself, you know? And it's all, it all sort of leads to the Jim, as you said, like coming a man, coming of age, becoming the hero. In a way, you know, he's just he's just rescued the Hispan Hispaniola, essentially, you know. So yeah, this was this is probably the best bit of the book for me, I think. Yeah, I think I would like echo a lot of things that you guys said. Um, the only thing I would would add is like like if there's an evil character in this book, it's gonna be Hans. Like there's an embodiment of evil among the pirates, it's him. And for Jim, the best time I thought I really enjoyed that. And yeah, I definitely agree with the becoming a man bit. Yeah, just just good swashbuckling fun. This this section, yeah. Your guy Hans, he's he's kind of like being sneaky, sneakier. Like you don't think Long John Silver, although as like a pirate and as devious, he wouldn't do this kind of like trying to sneakily kill Jim. Yeah. I know maybe Hans is doing this because he's injured as well, so he, he maybe thinks this is the only way he's going to best Jim. But yeah, he's it's just kind of like more evil. I think this they go around this sneaky method of trying to take him out and yeah obviously Jim this is probably Jim first ever killing someone as well so it is possibly a transition yeah to becoming a man yeah and a a loss of innocence as well yeah yeah exactly well yeah because if you think if you think about how Jim found himself here he was running away from you know someone else killing someone so you know complete 180 then because he he ends up killing hands like so, yeah. Cool. So after this, um, Jim returns ashore and goes back to the stockade, and he actually finds Silver and the pirates are in the stockade and not his companions. Um, and Silver tells Jim that when everyone's seen that the ship was gone, um, obviously they, they don't know what Jim has done yet. They don't know that it was him that took it and had it. But when everyone else seen that the ship was gone, they agreed to trust with the pirates, uh, where they would allow the pirates to have the map and then that the besieged party, basically Jim's friends, were allowed to leave. So then the doctor arrives in the morning to treat the, the wounded and sick pirates. Um, Jim basically is essentially now a captive of the pirates at this stage. And basically the doctor says um, to Long John Silver, um, they look out for trouble when he's on the side of the tre- treasure. Um, and basically what he means by this is we find out that the treasure is gone and that's, you know, the other pirates aren't going to be happy because they've basically been following Long John Silver this whole time and it's he's been like, boys, we're getting the treasure and the treasure's here and all, so of course they're going to be quite disappointed they find that it's not and are possibly going to turn on him. So um, the, the Doctor's kind of, you know, a quite quite a nice guy here, even though there's a war going on essentially between the two sides. The Doctor comes over to help the wounded and the sick and even warns Silver, who he is, you know, he, he obviously doesn't like even warns him to and then silver again kind of uses his cunning and intelligence to 
say that we need Jim. I think all the other pirates are kind of intent on killing Jim because he's uh, more or less on the other side and stuff, and he's caught being the one causing a lot of the trouble. It was him first overheard the, the plan and stuff and told everyone about it. Um, so I think they're kind of out to get Jim, but the Long John Silver uh, has taken a liking to Jim and tries to save him and then kind of has a secret conversation where he's basically saying that these boys are going to turn on me and if they do, it's it's me and you against them, that he's going to ha- we have to have each other's back and stuff. So again, it's kind of almost like the Long John Silver is switching sides again here, um, although he still wants to get the treasure. Um, he's... He, he kind of is trying to cut, almost cut his losses. He's, he's trying to do a deal. And basically, Jim says that I, if they're going to be a teaming up, that uh, he'll put on a good word if they if they do return home. And, you know, hopefully the Long John Silver doesn't get uh, uh, killed. So, yeah, they, they set out um, to get the, the treasure um, using the map. And then, as they're on the way, they find a skeleton, which basically Jim notices has its arms pointing towards the treasure and then they hear shouts um which sound like captain flint's last words it's actually ben gun pretending and you know all the superstitious pirates are crapping themselves because they think that now it's some ghost haunting this treasure um of their former captain and i'm assuming then i don't know if it's mentioned but maybe they must have mutinied on captain flint if he's haunting this treasure or whatever but yeah they find it to be empty and then yeah the pirates are more or less out to kill Silver and Jim, but then the the rest of the boys, um, the c- good guys, show up and drive them off. So, what do I think about this part? Again, a lot more action, kind of the the switching sides again of Long John Silver, and more kind of like you almost kind of start to like him here again because of his, you know, he's kind of sticking up for Jim. So, what what do you think? You you uh you originally compared uh Long John Silver to Barbosa. It actually, this actually reminds me uh, more of Captain Jack Sparrow, the switching of sides, because I remember when I first watched Pirates of the Caribbean, obviously at this stage, you know, he's so popular in pop culture, we know what Captain Jack Sparrow wants and everything. But that first movie, I was like, his motive switched so much. I was like, is this guy the villain or, or not? I remember having that feeling when I watched it when I was young. And I kind of, I like, that's what I really like about uh, Long John Silver in this section. It's kind of like, his motives are switching about. He's he's switching sides just to get whatever he wants. Um, and you're and you're kind of he's bringing a lot more complexity to his character. You're wondering is he a good guy or has he just very pragmatic? He's just out for this treasure and saying what he needs to say to get out of it. But or does he really care about Jim? Uh, so I think there was a lot of complexity added to him in this section. There was a good bit of, you know, tension with how are they going to get out of this situation if the pirates do all turn against them. You have the doctor who is kind of, he, he's, as we, as we said a lot of times in this episode, the pir- pirates have their own code. He is living by his doctor's code to protect people. So it's a, it's kind of a, a parallel of that. I thought it was a pretty effective part of the story. I love the intensity of the exchanges between Jim and, and Long John Silver. I love the way they talk to each other and the the, perfor- the performances between them. Yeah, just just to touch on what you said about um, <clears throat> Long John's motives. I'm not sure if he necessarily changes motives. I think his motive stays the same the whole way through, and that's to, like self preservation. You know, like to look out for himself above everybody else, and you know, that, I think that's why he's he's going, kind of going after the treasure and. Also, why he sides with Jim because he knows he's the because he knows they're probably screwed, right? <laughs> you know, the other side has the has the boat and everything, and there are just a few few men left. So, uh, Jim's his only way out. So, I think his motive is to just stay alive <laughs> the whole way through, mm. or just to, I suppose, yeah, what I said, self preservation, like, or to to have a better life. Let's that's you know let's keep talking about his wife and everything and how he. He's gonna go yeah. meet her somewhere where we know where he, when he gets his share of the treasure. So, yeah, maybe I'm I'm projecting too much or giving him too much credit by saying that he could have like more altruistic uh, motives within that too. But I I did I did feel like he genuinely had some affinity towards um Jim. Oh, I I would I would definitely agree. Like I I think there's definitely that, but he's also looking out for himself. Do you know? Um, yeah. Because I th- I think Long John's a morally grey 
character. Do you know, he, he does bad yeah. things, you know, inverted commas. But at, at the heart, he's a good guy. And he likes Jim. And he's, Jim's just like a teenager. He's been kind of thrust into this scenario that he had, you know, with all these yeah. uh, ruffians. So I think I think there is something there, yeah. Once you get the interaction then, like on the next butts with uh, Long John Silver and like the, you know, the gold. And he's kind of like sitting there, I just want to see the gold. Like, I know I'm not getting any of it, but I just want to see it and like touch it. It's kind of like yeah. he's, this is this was his big score, his final score, because he's like an older pirate and he, this is him trying to retire. And obviously he never got to do this. And now he kind of maybe sees Jim, a bit of himself and Jim. I was like, Jim, you know, Jim has a big future ahead of him. He could, you know, be the next great pirate day get the big score and stuff, so maybe he's kind of almost acting, trying to mentor Jim as a, in a way as well. Uh, I think there's definitely a bit of that for definitely. Yeah. I think it's said that like Long John Silver sees a bit of himself in Jim anyways, yeah. you know, I think I do think he genuinely likes him, I do see it as like merely like a father-son relationship, and I think Jim really likes Long John Silver as well, but I think it's just so it's just, I think his own moral compass is sort of pulling between like the like, you know, the standard, oh, he's a pirate, he must be bad. You know, and he has obviously led to the deaths of a few people, but I think he does genuinely care for Jim, probably for a few reasons. But I think one of them being that he sees so much of himself in Jim. He thinks Jim can be, like, the next great pirate. Yeah. I, I just wanted to touch on that moment Jonathan brought up too about the uh, about how he just wanted to see the gold. And I kind of, I thought that was kind of weirdly touching that moment because it was kind of the way i kind of interpreted it was that he it's the legend of the treasure and the kind of the pursuit of it that he is is taking joy in kind of more than the more than the material things that the treasure would buy him i don't think that would actually bring him as much joy as as simply having it and and having done it yeah that's that's a really good point like i think the exact same like that's why i think he, he he doesn't really think maybe when he's comparing himself with Jim, it's not the pirate bad side, it's the adventurous side and the one they find it go on this great expedition and get to the end of it and find whatever is at the end. And like, yeah, he's just like, Yeah, yeah exactly, he's just yeah. he just want he didn't care about having the treasure, he just yeah, wanted to complete it, you know, have have done it and say that yeah, I was a good pirate, I got this treasure or this amount of money or whatever. So yeah, I think for him it is about the re- reputation of being a great adventurer as opposed to, you know, having a load of money about you. Yeah, and in that way you can almost see how, how Jim could potentially become someone like that. Yeah, definitely. Because the motives, the, it's the same kind of motive at heart. Cool. So the very last section then of the book, so I mentioned before that Ben Gunn had already found and dug up the treasure. Um, So he essentially gives it to Jim and the rest of the the good guys and they all head back to the ship which Jim had hidden and essentially leave the other pirates the only one they take is Long John Silver they take him with them because they stuck up for Jim and whatever and the rest of the pirates are basically just left on the island and they sail back to um, Bristol and basically then they um, all split up the treasure so at the the actual port at um, their first port basically before they actually get back to the uh, Bristol. Um, so the first place they stop off, Silver, um, who whose future was quite still unknown. Like you know, will I would get back and he would be actually still executed or whatever, or pr- imprisoned for life or whatever was going to happen to him. He steals a bag, a small bag of the money, and escapes. And there's a good scene where you know he talks with Jim. Um, Jim's is on watch at the time that he's sneaking away, and Jim's like, "What have you got there? Like, what are you doing?" He's like, "Oh." basically just taking my share and i'm heading off and jim's like i can't let you do that like you're you're not entitled to a share or whatever he's like and basically the, cat, the long john silver's like you know you don't even see me or whatever and then he go heads like you know jim says i'll shoot you and he's like no you won't and stuff like that as in like i know i know you're a good guy like you wouldn't you wouldn't do that you know that i stuck up up for you and you know you'll let me have this small one because obviously the the jim does have some kind of good feelings towards Long John Silver as well, um, because he does let him go, and then kind of you know lies to the whoever it is comes up and says what's the the cat their Long John Silver's escaped or whatever. Did you see anything stuff? But yeah, then they go back to Bristol and divide up the treasure, and Jim 
basically returns to his mum and I think there's another kind of good scene here where his mum's like I don't even recognise you like who's my boy left me who's this man that's returned um, which again just kind of shows that the, the full circle of the or the sorry the, the complete completion of the arc that Jim's came of age and transformed from the boy he was into this like kind of hardened man who's kind of seen some stuff now he's killed a person you know he's he's, he's been through it so Jim killed a guy yeah, what's what's your what were your thoughts then on the ending of this book? I like the ending. Yeah, I thought I, I think the the ending was really well done, and there's there's it shows the great irony of the book too because you know they get they get back and all the pirates have been defeated, right? So piracy has lost the day, but then the doctor and the squire start talking about how you know they've they've got so much of this money. I can't remember the numbers, but they got they they get so much money out of this, uh, even though like pile of people died and whatever, and Ben Gunn's only getting like a, a tiny portion of it and whatever. So it's like yeah, the great irony is that you know the pirates were you know mutinied to get to get this treasure when in fact the true worst pirates are the Doctor and the Squire because they've just taken all the money that they had no claim to and it's fine, it's somehow legal. <laughs> For them to do it, yeah. Too. I think uh, I think you're spot on, Stephen. Yeah. So yeah, and I think yeah. I think that you know the, yeah, that, was, that was a big thing of the book was like the, the the sort of morality of people uh, as in black and white. Yeah, I think I've talked about that enough. <laughs> but then yeah, long I long John's escape. Corrupts. You know, it's it's kind of like th- this is what I was talking about earlier, where Jim sort of has to make a choice too. So he has to like choose what kind of man he's going to be is he going to be like a you know an honorable a sort of honorable man like silver or is he going to be like a a, a false honorable man like the the squire who who actually just you know is in pursuit of money do you know and jim sort of rejects both sides and he's going to do his own thing because you know the doctor comes to him and says um what does he say they talk about ben gone and jim basically <laughs> And, you know, gives him a hard time saying, like, you know, Ben earned that money and you're just taking it all off of him. I, I really like the end. Of it. I thought it wrapped their thing up nicely. And, like, the captain just, like, like uh, rationalizes, like, Ben Gunn's, like, the allowance is, like, well, Ben Gunn's just going wasted. You know? Aye. Yeah. Which is, which is not fair. It's just, you know, he found it. He, he spent all that time dragging it to safety. And then, as you say, like, I, I think they are the sort of bigger pirates in the end of. But yeah, like it's it's just like oh sure he's just going wasted. It'll be better in my own pocket. Exactly. I'll just give him a bit more when he needs it. But it's like how how do you ever expect any better himself when he's only given a small amount? Like you know. Exactly, and the and mad thing that I think too is like I, I sort of touched on this before is like so the squire and the doctor they're they're just going to spend this money like it's no bother. But if it, the pirates were doing that, like we were talking about, they have to bury it because it's illegal. It's mad. Yeah. That is, that is mad. <laughs> I like the ending. I, I agree with what Stephen said. Really, all I really wanted to bring up about the ending was was the whole Ben Gunn situation. I don't really have much more to add. Yeah, I I really like the ending too, uh, and I think Stephen used the perfect word, which is irony. And I think it is kind of like the it goes back to the the code of the pirates, and it's like the Squire and the Doctor. They kind of their absence of code in this moment. And I think that it's definitely got Jim internally questioning again what kind of path does he want to go down and what kind of traits does he want to adopt. And I think greed is a big theme of this book and it kept kind of seeing the corruption of greed and how and how it corrupts everybody in society, not just pirates in different ways. And you get the moment, I thought it was a powerful moment with um, Long John Silver when he had that choice and then it's and then he lets him go and it's kind of yeah, the legend loves on i thought it was a powerful moment too of his mother it could have easily like i think a, a scene like that you have to it has to really be earned to have that arc feel like when he comes home and she doesn't recognize him and that he's a different person you have to feel like the story did transform him for that to land and i think the story did earn that and that did land he did feel like a different person at that stage his arc was complete so I thought it, it rounded off everything very, very well. Also, just, just to touch on something you said there, but, you know, he has to choose you know, the traits that he wants to adopt. 
Uh, do you think he goes back at the end? He, he kind of realizes that his dad had it right the whole time, and that you know he just wants to go home and run his in with his ma. I think that's a possible. That's a possible outcome. Yeah. Um. Because at the start, you know, he he kind of his dad's all shown as all like very weak and you know um, does doesn't have any adventure in him, and then you know Jim's done all that now. He's like, oh, do you know what? I just want to go back to the Admiral Bembo and just yeah. Yeah, because even. Work possibly admire his dad more for what for what he was instead of what he wasn't yeah yeah well i've kind of covered my points i really really enjoyed the end of the book yeah i, I just really love the the moment jim and along john silver have and then the the moment with jim and his mom now where she doesn't recognize him i just think yeah it was a very powerful ending and about the you know what the, the choices in the road that jim has gone down and what road is up ahead of him you know, I guess it's kind of left up to interpretation and you don't really know, but like, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of everything in the book. Is there anything else, any points that we missed or anything else you just want to bring up about the book? Uh, we just didn't really chat about the part very much, but I do find him <laughs> quite creepy at times. The part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about the, the singing as well? Um, there was a few renditions of yo ho ho in a bottle room. I think it was probably about five or six times. I kind of like the singing because it sort of just added to the depth. They were all terrible. I like the singing. Yeah. But like, <laughs> it, it, it definitely added to it, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. again, one of the things the, the kind of audio drama side, I think, brought that, you know, I think if you ever, is it, is it Lord of the Rings? I think that has songs or whatever on it. Or is it Game of Thrones? Yeah. Remember? And it's like, whenever you listen to the narrator singing well, it. Well, both do, but Lord of the Rings has more. Uh, and you're just like listening to the narrator singing it and you're like, oh, Jesus, it's horrible. Whereas this here was kind of like, <laughs> it was proper, like, how do we tune it on? Yeah, I thought, I thought it was just, it was brilliant. But you don't like the Tom Bombadil songs and Fellowship? Oh, don't even <laughs> know. We'll talk about Tom Bombadil someday. <laughs> I've got a lot of opinions. Like Tommy V. You've got the bear and the maiden fair too. And oh, and oh geez. Hey, that's a tune. There's a, f- <laughs> there's a cast of mirrors, a good tune. Yeah. Yep, so that's everything then for the um, our book review. We'll kind of move on now to our star ratings. So I won't pick anyone who wants to go first, given their star rating. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go first. I think, I think I'll give it a four. I really liked it. I'm definitely above average like, you know. It wasn't, wasn't amazing, but I definitely did really enjoy it. And I think I would listen to it again, for sure. Performances were all good. I think Jim's performance was a wee bit weak, but... Uh, you know, it was fine, and yeah, it it just it really immersed me. Yeah, I well, I'm actually surprised. I thought I would have been the lowest, um, but I'm also going to give it a four out of five. It was good, enjoyed it. Would maybe maybe visit it again at some stage, but yeah, I think a four or four out of five is respectable for for the for the book. And you know, there's still some some parts that I didn't didn't love, which is maybe dragged down a bit. You know, it wasn't. Fully engaged the whole way through, but I think uh, four out of five is fair. Yeah, I'm gonna be big, generous, Mike again, and go a bit higher and give it a a four point five. Um, I thought the production on this was absolutely phenomenal. I thought it was so well put together, so well edited, so well performed. The story it did have small parts where I was less engaged, but I don't think any it had any weak parts. I would not describe them as weak at all. I thought it was a really great tight story. It was the abridged. I thought it being abridged like that would put me off, but I thought it was very well adapted. It didn't feel like I haven't read the original version, so I don't know what it left out, but it didn't feel like much was left out from what I felt. I felt like the core of the story still was there. The only thing that would probably stop me from bumping this up to like the, a five is um, I feel like if I was to compare this to something like Pirates of the Caribbean, I, I I just liked the more epicness and the bigger cast, and I I think if it had have been if there had have been more twists and turns and maybe more central characters with histories intertwining between each other, I might have bumped it up to that five. But this I still really really like this book. I'm prob I, I'm like excited to play this audiobook for my son one day when he's old enough and hope hope that he enjoys audiobooks as well. <laughs> Jeez, imagine, imagine <laughs> that having raised your child from birth and like all the effort and work goes on that, they find out that he doesn't like audiobooks. It would be a catastrophe. And he hates the if... 
<laughs> Jonah, if you're listening, <laughs> if you're listening to this sometime in the future, the distant, distant future, I'm either very disappointed or very proud. One, one or the other. <laughs> Unrelated, you can cut this out, but uh, Arsenal just scored a 97th minute winner. They won 4-3. Leave it up. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Arsenal, cannons, pirates. See, ties back. <laughs> right. Then myself, Michael, you just basically said everything that I was thinking there, so I won't say anything more. I will also give it a 4.5 for the exact same reason. Again, I think story-wise, yeah, like it wasn't the big epic that I think a 5 would deserve, or would the epic that I would give a, f- a 5 for an epic, is what I'm trying to say. It was kind of a smaller story, but still a lot of powerful points in it, and I think, yeah, the, the main thing is the, the production behind this and the the music or audio adaptation um so that i think that has definitely pulled it up from a four to a 4.5 for me but yeah i really really enjoyed this book um so yeah that's that's the star ratings done so comparisons to other media um of course anything with pirates any pirate media <laughs> yeah i think pirates of the caribbean do fair like it has a very similar start to this it's kind of like you've got, um, you know, what do you call uh, Orlando Bloom's characters, kind of like they're loving this v born kind of life in this British uh, colony or whatever. And then some strange character, age Captain Jack Sparrow, just shows up one day and starts co- causing havoc. It's kind of a, a similar kind of story. So obviously it's heavily inspired by this and Pirates of the Caribbean has yeah. all the, the pirate tropes, you know, the one-legged pirate, the, the pirate, which is actually a monkey and this, um, I guess, just to be different. Yeah, it's the black seals and black flags with skulls on it and looking for treasure and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, this this is probably, I'd say this, this book was probably a good transition from the actual bad pirate times to pirates as, you know, cartoony characters and stuff like that. This is kind of probably a turning point. All right. I mean, yeah, for, for me, comparison wise, it's any pirate media, like we said. The big one is another uh, adaption of Treasure Island, which is the Muppets Treasure Island, <laughs> which uh, I love that film. Uh, I just watched it with my daughter, still holds up. Although it is completely different to the book. Well, not completely different, but it takes heavy liberties with the You're plot. You're telling me that no one gets killed or m- mutilated oh, people, or anything? People, uh people people definitely get killed uh maybe maybe not as like as gruesome but i think it does happen but it's definitely even more cartoony again obviously but they take heavy liberties with the plot <laughs> there was there is an actual treasure island movie released in the 50s don't know has any seen it is there not like treasure planet that's what i was gonna well? say yeah i've seen that one no i've never heard of that there i think there's a there's a tv show i think as well but that might be old as well I think Johnny mentioned about a show. Um, when I was actually looking up something else, I found out there's apparently a prequel TV show to the book called Black Seals. Oh, it's, it's about like uh, what you call him, Captain Captain Flint's and like the the original crew and like Billy Bones and stuff. Apparently, well, very, I never watched it. Good. What's that? But, all uh, I never watched that. I don't know actually. It's not on Prime. So I can find out. It sounds like it's on Prime. It sounds like a Prime show. Or yeah, I think, uh, I think it's on. I think there, it is. Um, I just like look whenever I seen it, I think it looked a bit low budget or something, but maybe that's good. Um, and like one one comparison to the media, which is quite close to my heart. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever played it before because it's a PlayStation exclusive. But Uncharted Four, it's based on I have yeah a pirate story. I I love that game. Like it's so good. Yeah, and the story is so good. I love the whole well quadrilogy, I suppose. But I think do you know what's a good yeah. than... a good pirate adaptation? is the Assassin's Creed Black Flag, which is not really an assassin game. Yeah, I was thinking that too, John. Yeah. So, such a good pirate game. Like, it's just... There's actually a, a one coming out, uh, maybe the end of this year or next year, maybe. Skull and Bones, I think you call it. It's like Ubisoft they're making. So it's an actual dedicated pirate one. I'm assuming they're kind of using some nice. of mechanics from that one. But yeah, that could be interesting. Like, it's a good pirate game. It's definitely needed since the Black Flag days. But for Skull talking and Bones about games, been coming out for a while. the pirate game that sticks out for me is Monkey Island all the Monkey Island games if you've ever heard of those it's like point and click uh, adventure games it's very Never heard of them. similar no. no there's you're looking for the secret of Monkey Island which is like buried treasure 
well, it's not, but anyway, it's good. <laughs> Has a lot of the same tropes, but it's done in like a very funny style. You know, it's more jokey than serious. So I just wanted to mention that this book was published as a serial and a magazine. Was it? Yeah, so it was originally published episodically, but by but which was a lot more common back then. Is that because of like publishing costs of a full book? Or I think it, it like I, a, new, a newspaper. I don't. I can't. I can't give you the exact reason why it was more common. I just. I think people were just used to consuming fiction like that. They were. They yeah, liked it's it, probably those little. Probably harder. I to create like you know like novels, fiction novels. Like people only wanted to you know get you yeah. create books that were like factual or whatever. Like they didn't want to be freaking buying a wee book about pirates or whatever. Because like, you don't have buy-in as well, so it's just a whole huge money sink if nobody likes it. Yeah, and like the the the, the cost of like printing and distributing back then would have been massive like and the lack of like you know illiterate people <laughs> yeah exactly probably um, factors in too, yeah. do you see the the name of that was was originally the sea cook a story for boys <laughs> yeah <laughs> like what a what a weird name <laughs> also treasure island so much better title well. yeah <laughs> it's <laughs> like the sea cook a story for boys i doesn't really sum up anything like it could be anything treasure island yeah. nowadays is just yeah that's about pirates <laughs> Yeah. Treasure Island isn't even, it's not even that good a name for it. Like, I mean, there is treasure on the island, but you see a treasure island and you think, you know, it's Bremen with treasure. You can't turn, <laughs> turn around without there being some treasure, like. But then, yeah, when you compare it to the Sea Cook, a story for boys, it's not very good, is it? <laughs> I think the, the island in the book too is called like Skeleton Island, and it's like, what, like skeletons are like, why are skeletons and skulls and bones and all so associated with pirates as well? Yeah. So it's a weird kind of way. Like, was that? I don't know. I don't even know if it was in this book. Like, they because I don't know. If, I think they had black flags, but I don't think they mentioned about the, the Jolly skin. Roger. I, they they did die. Yeah, I don't know if if it was from this book, like, or did was that a thing? Like, actual pirates would fly because, like, why I would think you want? Yeah. Why would a pirate fly those colors? <laughs> Let everyone know you're pirates. Do you know what I mean? A warning, I think, or I guess I uh, because they're nice and they give you black spots and all, and let you know that you're about to get wrecked. Like if they if they flew the flag, then the people are more likely they surrender, maybe because oh shit, yeah. it's pirates. Uh, it's probably just... yeah, yeah. And st- they won't have to like engage with them as much. They probably also like that as the sport as well of like the chase. You know, whenever they see it, they're like, right. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so we'll go. We'll do this quick then. What else are we consuming? Um, I'll just blast through mine really quick. So I am reading a book called The Glucose Revolution. I don't know if you've read that one, Michael, but it's it's basically... Oh, yeah, have, yeah. Yeah, it's a very famous one, um, kind of in the realm of those books that you like. But it's basically about, like, you know, gl- gl- glucose spikes and how they can cause so many things, especially also type 2 diabetes and even like like depression and like all mad things like infertility and things like that and basically it's about like how you tap stuff how do you flatten the glucose curve and all it's quite interesting i don't know like the first tap on it is like the order in which you eat things which is basically like eat your fiber first and then like your sugars and all on top of that so like it digests and absorbs slower but i was thinking like if you like eat right in the right order then you like say if I can do a handstand and everything in your belly gets flopped upside down and all like surely that's not really gonna <laughs> matter then <laughs> what order you've edited on so I think that tap's a bit stupid but in terms of the other tops so far they look good um I won't spoil any more but um no it's, it's quite an interesting book and seems to have helped a lot of people so I'm hoping it could be a good thing for you know it's you know it says a lot of the things that it can solve is like you know when you feel really just crashed in the evenings apparently i can solve that so be interesting to read about it and see if i can fix it but yeah that's an interesting book and i'm actually i actually bought the physical copy so i'm going to try as well as my audiobooks i'm going to try and read like an actual physical book as well because i feel like like listening to an audiobook or like reading one on the screen and all is still like you're technol- using technology and stuff like that and i'm just like as i work on software and stuff i'm just surrounded by technology all day so it's good just before bed they kind of have nothing on then and just yeah. look at the book so i'm just gonna try and add that habit so i bought a few books um i'll bring up the other ones then when i'm on to those in the f- in future episodes but yeah actually reading we that, didn't we didn't talk about that you did that for this book didn't you did what you read the book and listened to it simultaneously oh so i don't mention that no i actually got another free audible book 
that was this book as well. So I, I wanted to listen to the unabridged version, but to be honest, it's the exact same, which is why I haven't really brought it up. The, <laughs> right. the story's very similar. Fair enough. So, yeah. so yeah, I like listened to another version of Treasure Island, an actual version, but yeah, I, I didn't, didn't really see any main differences that were worth bringing up. So, But it meant that I was really prepared for hosting this episode because I'd listened to the story twice, so <laughs> know it know it quite well now. Yeah. Not the Muppets yeah. version, though. Exactly. <laughs> True. I think apart from that, yeah, everything I'm consuming is still the same as last time, so still playing Fallout. Yeah, still listened to Dave Grohl book about halfway through it now, so I listened to it when I'm running, so um, yeah. Kind of working my way for those, but yeah, that's everything for me. What's everybody else up there? Uh, not, not too much for me. I, I just picked up the an, another book, uh, Abroad in Japan, if you've ever seen that guy on YouTube. He's got a he's got a an autobiography about like you know how he gets because for those that don't know he's like an English guy who like moved to Japan to teach English and now he does YouTube stuff and it's really interesting. So it's like about his story of how he ended up in Japan. And, like you know he he didn't really speak the language when he got there and he thought he'd be you know screwed. But yeah, I, I'm listening to that. I just started it and I think it's it's going well so far. Uh, and then I'm also thinking about picking up. Uh, David Mitchell's book, uh, the comedian, he was in Peep Show and everything. He he just released a book about history of England's king kings and queens, uh, but it's it's done in like a funny way, as I understand it. So I think that might be good. I think he's really funny. So that's like his that. his his character in Peep Show is the kind of person that likes the actual books like that. Ah <laughs> uh, yeah, his his character in Peep Show isn't a million miles away from him. Yeah, I think. I'd say apart, from, apart from the sort of like you know. Uh, sort of sheepish way to him. I think yeah. other than that, they're the same. <laughs> like he's he's probably obviously a lot more intense in this uh, move, but he's 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 obviously quite uptight in real life as well. I'm assuming and stuff. He's obviously like, just think, based as if you ever watch him on uh, on uh, what's that show? That's a panel show he's on. Um, Would I lie to you? Uh, uh, he's, he's, yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Like uh, so, I might pick that up and give it a listen to. But yeah, uh, other than that, same old stuff for me uh started slow horses season three as i said i don't know if i said that on the episode but started it it's, it's really good uh just like the other seasons i was thinking about starting the second book uh for that i know we read the first one before i was thinking about picking the second one up and seeing how it is obviously i know what's going to happen because i've watched season two but anyway <laughs> cool michael so yeah, so I talked about that uh, glucose revolution book on the podcast very early day. Some, um, it's a I think it's a pretty legit book. When I've done the it, done the tips and everything, they they seem they seem to work. Um, I think the the vinegar one is definitely very effective. Um, I have like vinegar on salt and vinegar chickpeas like every day roasted chickpeas that I make in the air fryer literally every day with like apple cider vinegar and sea salt. They are really good and i do be full up for ages after them uh i think especially the biggest the best way to like burn sugar effectively is definitely position in your exercises and then around your like carb consumption that is especially around the time you're having like simple carbs like like desserts and stuff like that that would definitely be make a big difference to like the the blood sugar spikes and everything in my experience just what I'm doing. I haven't I haven't watched too much TV. I finished uh finished Ted Lasso. Uh haven't really watched anything after after that. Um I've been out running. My I like when I was at my fittest, my weekly volu- volume was at about forty forty kilometers a week. I'm I'm not near that at the minute. I'm only like I'm at like twelve point five at the minute. But uh, I'm enjoying being back at the, in the habit and just going, you know, wee danders in the morning. Uh, as I think I, I touched on it last episode, but I like started the cold therapy Jonathan referred to in the last uh, book review episode. Anyway, um, I, I read um, Wim Hof's book, the the Ice Man's book, his his method, and all the all the amazing things he basically talked about the cold. Um, I think I'm sort of sometimes a bit skeptical of um of books that they suggest that this one thing will cure everything because every book suggests that about their one thing. Uh, but I think there's a a way to go into something with like a healthy skepticism. Like there's so much like different advice in the world. I think you're as long as something doesn't sound dangerous, it's you should just try things. 
and, and try them with like an open mind, but still have that skepticism to be like, I'm, I'm going to bow out if it's not working. So I'm trying it with an open mind. I'm doing the cold therapy and everything. And it does seem to be helping. It's, it's pretty, I, I hate, I hate cold showers, but obviously that's sort of the point. Uh, you feel good afterwards and everything. Um, so that's one, one thing I'm doing and I'm starting to make a more of a meditation habit. I've been reading some books or listening to some books on mindfulness. And I think I, I mentioned last episode, I'm like doing the dopamine fast and I've like stopped using social media before certain hours and everything. So now I only use it at specific times of the day to slowly like phase it down more and more. So that's basically everything that I've been doing. Very good. Jason. Um, yeah, it's all a bit more exciting than me. Um, I suppose what I've really been getting up to at the minute is uh, just another audiobook I've been listening to since finishing Treasure Island. Um, been listening to, I don't know if you've ever heard of Annie Mack, uh, the former Radio 1 DJ. Yeah. She's sort of left that career behind. She's now a writer. Uh, she's released two books. Um, her first one I've never read, but like it got like quite like widely acclaimed. Um, I've actually jumped in on her second book called The Mess That... The Mess We're In, I believe it's called. I really enjoyed it so far. I don't want to say too much more about it because potentially that or her first book I may end up choosing as a pick sometime in the future. But it's uh, it's good. Something different from from what we've been listening, on, listening to on the podcast. Apart from that, I mean, we've been watching a bit of that new uh, uh, Godzilla TV show. I finally started an episode of Slow Horses. I enjoyed it. Actually, I will continue watching the show. But yeah, one episode in. Does yeah, Gary Oldman no. look as smelly as, as we've heard? <laughs> he, he he does look smelly. I, I stand by it. <laughs> Very good. Not, Gar- not Gary Oldman in general, though. You can't say that. No, Surely just, not, just You can't say that. You don't know. Just, <laughs> don't, I don't know. In Batman, he looks a wee bit smelly, too. And he's definitely smelly in Harry Potter. <laughs> Third one. Uh, oh, aye. Grey staff himself, so yes. <laughs> yeah, he was in prison for like freaking 12 years or whatever so. the man's on the <laughs> <laughs> very good alright um, plugs just the usual YouTube for me I haven't really done much again still working on a few things so yeah that's that's everything for me I don't have any I'm bored I'll go super quick None just um, I mentioned how this book was written as a serial I am currently writing a serial a Christmas horror story collection called white winter i'll put a link in the description if you want to check it out it's going to be seven parts i have three out so far i'm going to post episode four next week i'd originally planned to get this all out before the 23rd of december because that's when the story set for place already i am looking like i'm going to be over that it's going to be the 30th at best now and i think because of how big the last part is being written at the minute it's probably going to go over that slightly so whoops I'm as soon as it hits it back the, tw- the 26th, Michael, Christmas is over and I'm not listening to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no plugs for me, but I have I have been enjoying White Winter, actually, Michael. It's a nice Oh, nice. For, uh... White Winter. <laughs> cool. Nothing for me, Jason, in terms of plugs? Nah, nothing for me. Nothing for me. Cool. Well, that's kind of everything for my host injuries. I will pass the reins to Jason now and I'll uh, reveal the next book. Hi. Um... So we, we very briefly were chatting, I think it was just yesterday, actually, in our group chat about a few, like, you know, non-fiction books, autobiographies we have been, we had read in the past. And actually, like, before I joined this podcast, I I think maybe at the time, it was maybe when I just first moved to Glasgow, so maybe early, twenty twenty or sorry, mid-late 2022, apologies, where this author actually came to Glasgow and I went to his live show because my fiance was quite interested in his work um, so I hadn't actually read any of his stuff at this stage so I remember like getting into this author the podcast had just sort of started I was um, sort of thinking oh, I'd love to join this and we get these guys to read read this guy I've now joined I now have no idea how I will host an episode <laughs> uh, regarding this book I'm about to pick but I'm going to send away I don't think there's going to be much in terms of guessing so, you know, we're doing our first non-fiction book of the podcast. It's by an artist, uh, an author called David Sedaris, and the book is called Calypso, uh, also narrated by David Sedaris himself. I don't know if anyone here will know who David Sedaris is. You might know who his sister is. She's a famous Amy Sedaris. Um, if anyone here has watched BoJack Horseman, she plays the purple cat. 
Ah, uh-huh, right. Yeah, and David Sedaris actually voices someone in that show as well, but like a very brief one episode appearance. So David Sedaris is just a guy who likes to tell really funny stories, essentially. he His books are generally just a collection of these stories. They sort of jump about a bit. They're all just a bit funny, some are a bit sad, and there's no real... Well, I think there's usually like a bit of an overarching theme. I've only actually read one of his books, but this is his highest rated book of them all. Um, I don't think there's any need for us to guess because, well, I don't even know what happens, but uh, I think, as I say, it's just a bunch of random stories with maybe a slight sort of theme to it. But, I mean, anyone want to have a look at that picture and take any sort of swings as to what might be going on in this book? So you're saying that the, so it could be a collection of stories? So yeah. Like, yeah, so like... If the guess, if we guess any or maybe a couple of the stories, whoever guesses the most will we'll get the point. If you want, I'll give you ten words or less, Johnny. What's going to happen in this? Who's going for? Uh, 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 I go first. Am I allowed to jump up? Or yeah, you, go ahead. Like. Uh, so what we have here kind of reminds me of like Plank from. I was say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like it's kind of got like this dissonant look, but I'm, I'm imagining in my head it's like. It's like a door. So I am going to go a bit darker and guess that it's about an abusive childhood, but taking a funny spin on that. Fucking rage and you like said a, plank. Like a, a dark, say plank. like a dark <laughs> comedy spin on that. Right. Stephen, Johnny? I'm also going to say plank from Ed, Ed and Eddie, but because just based on the title, Calypso, I think, and it, this ties back to the current episode because Calypso appears in Pirates of the Caribbean, Pirates. Uh, I'm going to say it has something to do with the sea. Plank goes to the sea. And you have to walk the plank? plank and you have to walk the, the plank. See, it's all time back. Oh, that's all <laughs> oh, Jesus. I'm going to say Plank visits, Plank and Johnny visit the seaside. Grant. And then Johnny? I'm going to say nothing about Plank. I don't think this is just a plank of wood. I, again, I do think it's a door, like Michael said. But just to be different... I'll uh, say that Calypso, I'm pretty sure Calypso is like a brand or a type of coffee. <laughs> so I'm going to say that his stories are some kind of, you know, read during your coffee break kind of type stories. Oh, I don't know why, just anecdotes about coffee. <laughs> 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 right, lads. Do you, uh, do you, you only have a guess because you haven't read I it want- yet? Well, I've read some of his other story. I've read his most recent book, and I, th- I think it's, I think I, I would be, I would sort of know already potentially the route these stories will go. So I don't want to guess anything. So it's not about plank. And the fear that I. It's not about plank. <laughs> um, Could be about plank. I think one of these. I'm going to say I think one or two of these might be halfway there. Living on a prayer. Aye, right. um, but I think so. His guesses, lads. So just one last wee thing I want to leave these with is. Well, none of you knew David Sedaris. David Sedaris, as I say, is narrating this um, book. You're either going to love his voice or you're going to hate his voice. Oh, that's directed at me, isn't it? <laughs> no, that's directed at everybody. He has a very strange voice. Okay. We'll bring it on. And with very that, very nice. <laughs> I would like to bring an end to the episode. And get some sleep. Get yeah, some get sleep. And, uh, done get a 12 hour shift and then come on to record this podcast. So I am. Um, I've been rushing these lads. You're a grafter. Um, That's all it. work Jason's and no play no makes Jason a tired player. <laughs> but uh, look, uh, I look forward to having you all on um, for episode 20 and Calypso by David Sidar. So goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Yeah. Happy Cheers. 2024, everybody. Uh, see you on the flippity flopper, whatever my <laughs> catchphrase was again. <laughs> Should we do like a red dish and a yo ho ho? And fade out, on, ball fade ball out ball. on me saying that, Michael. Yo ho ho on a uh, bottle of flip side. <laughs> <laughs>